Hi, welcome to Western Civilization 1. And we're going to start this first week um, by talking about early Western Civilization um, between the periods of 4000 and 1000 BCE. Um, and what we're going to be doing this week is we're going to be talking about what it means when, when we talk about Western Civilization. What precisely do scholars mean so that we have a clear idea of how that's being defined. Now I say clear in the sense that we're going to talk quite a bit about um, the problems that scholars have experienced in, defining, in defining Western civilization. Um, so hopefully you'll come away from this with an understanding of what those debates are. So we're, when we talk about civilization, um, one of the classic defini definitions of civilization is that it is a way of life based on cities um, that are governed as political states under a central authority with a complex organization of labor, trade, religion, and other central aspects of human life. Um, this, is, this is oftentimes the way that we think of Western civilization um, and how it developed, that it developed with all of these structures um, and it developed in a way um, that looks more urban. Um, traditional historical definitions tend to focus on urbanized communities and they often tend to focus on central authority and complex social organizations such as labor, trade, and religion. Uh, civilization can be productive of prosperity and complexity but some historians contest its effect on quality of life and equality. Um, as well as the role of civilization in generating or increasing conflict. Now, the geographic notion of the West is Greek in origin, but the issue of definition always struggles with where to draw a line between East and West. Um, so while we talk about Western civilization, you'll notice that um, we, we will be talking a little bit about the Middle East at times, um, just because those lines between East and West are really difficult to define. Um, the influence that East and West have had on each other um, is, is oftentimes a difficult thing to, to differentiate. Um, so for an example, modern Turkey was part of the Roman Empire, but in the 21st century its Westernness and its fitness to join the European Union is continuing to be um, a hot topic of debate, of debate in Europe. It's difficult to define what ideas and customs make up the culture of a civilization. And if you have any doubts about that, just watch American television or travel around um, the United States to see how uh, culture can vary from one part of the country to another. The notion that cultures vary and that some are superior to others because of particular customs or practices is quite ancient. Over time, Western civilization has included a wide range of cultural variation. For example, polytheism was widely practiced in the ancient West, um, including in Mesopotamia and Egypt, but the idea of monotheism, or the, the worship of one god, also has Western roots, um, for example, um, Jewish, it, it has Western roots in a later area, era. Um, when it comes to social hierarchies and status, all known civilizations have established some kind of social hierarchy. Some practices like metalworking led to increased social differentiation as the acquisition of metals allowed individuals to display visible differences in social status. Um, think about the effect that gold has had on social status. This is a great example. Um, ultimately, the West is and was a story about the interaction over time of a range of cultures, and that's important to remember, that there isn't one single source of influence on the development of Western civilization, that it's the interaction of many cultures, um, including both tremendous variations within the West and with non-Western cultures. 
So again, think about the influence that the East has had on the development of Western civilization. Um, the West can only be understood by studying the history of these interactions, and we'll be doing quite a bit of that over the semester. Now, the societies we're going to talk about this week are Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Anatolia. Mesopotamia, uh, the importance of Mesopotamia is that the first cities developed among the Sumerians in Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq, Iran, and in the Middle East, um, by 4000 to 3000 BCE. And if you're unfamiliar with the term BCE, this basically stands for before the common error. You might be more accustomed to the use of BC, um, but in general, many scholars are using the, the um, abbreviation BCE to denote that same time period. Um, Egypt is a civilization that emerged along the Nile River around 3050 BCE. And then, of course, our third civilization, civilization that we're going to study this week is Anatolia. By about 2000 to 1900 BCE, civilization appeared in Anatolia, Crete, and other islands in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, as well as Greece. And all of these peoples learned from and built on the civilizations of Mesopotamia and Egypt. So, um, the emergence of cities. The cities of Sumer, um, the need to irrigate the fertile but dry plains around the Euphrates and Tigris rivers produced centralized political authority and organized cities led by kings, who also controlled the surrounding regions. By 3000 BCE, the Sumerians established 12 independent city-states, each of which had expanded to 20,000 residents or more by 2500 BCE. City-states were fiercely separate and fought each other over land and resources. Um, we have a lot of conflicts during this time period over land and resources. Cities were similar in layout, they were crowded, they were walled and they were dominated by large temples that we call ziggurats. City-states were prosperous from agriculture and trade, but generally unhealthy because of poor sanitation. We don't have good sanitation in these cities, so there, were, there was a lot of disease. Now the kings in Sumer ruled with councils, and they came from royal families at the top of the social hierarchy. Um, kings and not queens were responsible for ensuring justice, for developing laws, keeping order, and of course waging war, and in return they extracted taxes from the people. They lived in great palaces and enjoyed wealth, luxury, and the power of life and death over their servants. Slaves in Sumer were at the bottom of the social hierarchy. They could be owned by gods, um, if that wasn't something you were expecting, um, they could be owned by gods um, through temple officials or individuals. They could be owned by individuals as well. People became slaves by being captured in war or being sold into slavery or being born to slave parents. Now, the invention of writing occurred in this area at this time. It developed somewhere around 3500 BCE. Um, as a result of the need to track more complex economic transa transactions. Um, writing evolved from pictographs that symbolize specific objects to mixed pictographs and phonetic symbols. So we start to see um, changes in the development of writing um, from, from something a little more concrete um, to more abstract types of writing. A uh, fully developed Sumerian cuneiform, which is what we call Sumerian writing, cuneiform, was made up of wedge marks pressed into clay tablets to record spoken language. It was only understood or used by elite scribes, uh, but writing soon expanded to recording stories, beliefs, oral traditions, poetry, and literature. Um, so we get, we get some really interesting developments in the history of writing um, in terms of what what was being recorded. So, um, missing religion um, during this time is really interesting. Um, writing supported civilization by recording and passing down myths about the gods 
or the origins of civilization, and written religious teachings that emphasize communal religious responsibilities and divinely ordained hierarchy. Um, myths and religion taught that the gods, their power and human well-being were closely connected. So um, if, if the gods were unhappy with people, it was because of um, individual behavior or community behavior. Um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a long poem, this is one of those things that began to be recorded and is still very well known in the region. Um, it's a long poem that tells the story of a hero king of the city Uruk. Um, it also tells of his efforts to control his people and build a city, um, his struggles with and, and his alliance with another divinely created rival named en Enkidu, and their conflicts with monsters and the gods. So this is a very epic tale. And the story emphasizes the human desire for fame, power and accomplishment, but also the vulnerab vulnerability of humans in the face of the gods. Mesopotamian culture honored priestly divination, the ritual process for discovering the will of the gods, and earning their favor. So this is a map from your book, um, and it just basically shows the region um, that the Sumerians settled, um, what we think of as Mesopotamia, and you can see that that it's it's really quite um, extensive. Uh, where you see Phoenicia over in the west um, is what we think of today as as Israel. Um, that is that territory. And then, of course, it extends down through um, modern-day Iran. Um, and these are some examples of cuneiform. Um, you can see the wedge shapes. They're really interesting. Um, and you can see how they changed over time from something a little bit more um, pictorial to something um, more abstract. Now, um, metals have proved to be very important in the development of civilization, um, and that, that is certainly true of Mesopotamia. Um, in the Sargon and Akkadian Empire, some city-states were particularly aggressive when it came to um, being able to build territory and exploit resources. Um, under King Sargon, the city-state of Akkad um, began to build the first empire around 2350 BCE as they conquered neighboring territory and cities in search of metals. Um, the spread of Sumerian culture um, occurred through conquest and these conquests spread Mesopotamian language, art, and literature throughout the Near East. So conquest and the spread of culture went hand in hand um, and in this way war promoted cultural interaction. And this won't be the. This isn't the first time that we'll see this in this course. Uh, now, civil war and an attack from the Gushan Hill people overthrew the Akkadian Empire around 2200 BCE. Um, and and really, we're talking about this in fairly quick terms. But of course, you can see the span of time that this occurred over. Um, now, leaders of the Ur Third Dynasty seized power in Sumer around 20, 2112 BCE. And don't worry about remembering all of these dates. I'm more concerned that you remember the concepts and, and what's occurring and the importance of those events. Um, when that occurred, it created a centralized economy and system of laws under kings who claimed to be divine. Again, something that this, this won't be the first time that we'll see um, rulers claiming to be divine. But civil war again weakened the empire, and external Amorite marauders caused its collapse after only about a century of, of rule. So this was fairly short-lived. Uh, and again, we have another map here that just kind of shows um, where Sumerian civilization, uh, where its general territories were in comparison to the Akkadian Empire. We can see that um, the, the Sumerians aren't quite down into where we think of as Israel, 
um, along the Mediterranean Sea. They've they've lost they've lost some territory there by this time period. Uh, the Assyrians, one of their accomplishments was long distance commerce. So Western civilization advanced even during a period of long term economic instability caused by climate change and agro agricultural pollution. These were problems during this time period. Um, but Assyrians who inhabited an independent kingdom in northern Mesopotamia pioneered long distance trade by private entrepreneurs. Um, they conveyed Anatolian products such as wood, copper, and gold throughout Mesopotamia. Um, they privately funded donkey caravans, con which conveyed goods over long distances. And when successful, these yielded high returns for investors. Royal regulators settled complaints, and they supported this trade. An important development at this time is is the the law of Hammurabi, um, and you'll have a You'll have a reading in your primary sources on the Code of Hammurabi. Uh, written laws helped Mesopotamian city-states maintain order, especially as commerce and trade expanded. Kings had a sacred duty to maintain order. This was a primary function of kings. And the Babylonia king uh, Hammurabi established a famous code of laws based on earlier Mesopotamian legal traditions. Hammurabi's code sought to maintain truth and equity and gave new attention to supporting less powerful members of society. This was very much a code of justice. The code included severe penalties for property crimes and offered some limited legal, protection, legal rights to women. The organizing principle of the code was equivalent justice. Um, and what, what this means is that depending on one's status in society, if a crime was committed against somebody, that status figured in the type of penalty that would, uh, would be um, enacted. Uh, Mesopotamian cities included many taverns and wine shops as well as some parks. Public health was a problem because of contaminated drinking water. Intellectual health was stimulated by the close proximity of so many and tremendous advances in mathematics and astronomy had enduring consequences. So with all of these people coming together, you get a lot of innovation. Uh, for Canaanite populations, um, they expanded as merchants from many lands were absorbed into their population. A diversity of population and practices led to innovation as well, especially in business. One important consequence was the emergence of an alphabet where letters stood for sounds a system that became the basis of Greek and Roman alphabets. So our alphabet um, has a long history um, of having been in the making. Okay, so uh, again, another map. Um, and if you, if you want to take a closer look at these, these are in your book. <clears throat> um, and we can see where, where Assyria was situated along the Tigris River. 